again. So the doctor probably just ordered a nuclear medicine stress test or a cardiac perfusion study. So you're probably going, what the heck is that? It sounds like these really big words. Well, my name is Paul. I used to be a nuclear medicine tech for about 15 years before I retired and became a pastor. Uh, and the funny part is people always uh, want to talk about healthcare and uh, faith or faith and healthcare. So this is what my channel is about. And today we're going to break down what is a nuclear medicine stress test, all the, all the things you need to know. And we even show you some pictures of what different types of scans look like. So the reason that your doctor might be ordering this test is they're thinking you've had a heart attack, uh, you're diabetic, uh, you're maybe getting set for a surgery. There's a whole number of reasons why your doctor would like the, to do this. But what they're really making sure is that your heart is strong, that your heart is in a good condition to do whatever it needs to do. If it's just living your day-to-day -day life or again, like I said, doing a surgery. So those are typical reasons why we do this type of exam. Now this exam does take a, a long time to do. Uh, when I say that, most nuclear medicine tests take at least an hour. This one, I, depending where you're at, could take three to four hours. So as I go through the protocol for this, uh, just to let you know, it's always best to check with the department that you're gonna be doing the test with. They should answer any questions you have, at least that's what I always did whenever I got a phone call about somebody wanting to know what an exam was like. So I'm gonna give you the generalities that I had. Uh, when I was doing the test now, grant, granted, it's been about 10 years since I've been in the industry, so a lot has probably changed since then, but I think the overall premise of it is probably the same. So again, uh, the test should take about three to four hours. Now, the prep for this is they generally don't want you to uh, have caffeine. Uh, now, you're probably wondering, well, why? Uh, and even decaf, so don't sneak that decaf coffee in there. I can't tell you the number of people we had to reschedule, even if they were walkers, and we'll talk about what walking means here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but yeah, so make sure you're, you follow the rules pretty well to be NPO, which basically means nothing by mouth. Uh, you'd think they would have a different acronym for that, but that's what NPO means. Uh, they generally uh, will tell you if you can take meds or not, and they'll, if you do have to take meds, they'll tell you to take it with a sip of water. Traditionally, we don't want you to eat uh, and again, like I said, I just talked to you about the caffeine. Uh, so those are some of the things. Uh, and again, they'll give you a prep sheet with exactly what uh, type of meds they want you to take and what type they do not want you to take. So the reason why they have these type of restrictions is the way that nuclear medicine works. We look at how blood is flowing uh, and we want everything to be at maximum peak efficiency when we take a look at your heart muscle. Now, the reason why we don't want you to have caffeine, even if you walk on the treadmill, which is why we call you a walker, uh, versus a drug-induced test, or no, we don't call you a druggie, don't worry about that, we don't do that. Uh, but the reason why we do that is, again, in case you would have to switch, it, it, some, sometimes we would we'd have people walk on the treadmill and they couldn't get to their 85% uh, or whatever target range they need to get you to uh, in order to inject the radio pharmaceutical. And so that's why it's always beneficial, even if you're walking on the treadmill, you should still refrain from having caffeine. With all that out of the road, so what does the actual procedure do? Well, again, we're taking a look at all the coronary arteries or basically the arteries that feed your heart muscle. Specifically, we're looking at your left ventricle of your heart. You might be wondering, well, why don't we look at your right? Uh, the reason why we don't look at the right is if, if you look at medical literature, you'll see that the right ventricle is a lot smaller than the left ventricle. You're probably going, well, why is that? Well, the right ventricle only has to get the blood into your lungs and guess where your lungs are at? Right behind your heart. As opposed to the left ventricle, which has got to scoot your the blood all the way from your head all the way down to the top of your toes. It's not good to have a blockage within the right ventricle of the arteries, but the left one is the one that we get really concerned with again because it gets the blood all the way around you. So. So that's basically what the test is looking for, how good those coronary arteries or heart arteries are doing. So there's a couple different ways that we can do this particular test. And again, I'm explaining generalities. Uh, always make sure you talk to your technologist beforehand to figure out what specific one you are going to be doing. So let's talk about how the test is. And like I said, I'm gonna go with about three to four hours. So we begin the test by doing what we call a resting set of pictures. And so the person will give you a uh, IV uh, now, the IV is important. Now, it depends. They might throw your, the IV in your hand. They might throw it up here in your antecubital. Um, but something just easy for us to get at. It's not a huge one. It's not like what they put in the emergency room. It's, it's fairly manageable. Uh, pretty, pretty small. Um, and just to know, it might be a little harder for your tech to put it in because you're probably going to be under like MPO, like I said before, nothing to eat by mouth. 
uh, nothing to drink basically so your veins aren't going to be very big because uh, you haven't had a lot of fluids and so there's some tricks that we can do in order to get your veins to pop up a little better so after we get the IV in we're going to inject you with a small amount of a radioactive material uh, and this material is going to circulate uh, for a couple of minutes so they might bring you right back in order to take pictures or they might wait a little bit it depends on what type of radio tracer now when I say radio tracer uh, a lot of people are like well does it contain iodine well Fortunately, it does not, so you should not have any side effects to this radioactive material. It sounds a lot scarier than what it is. Um, so when we use radioactive material, we don't use very much. Uh, we use to try to use a small amount as possible. Uh, so this is probably going to be about the same amount as what you'd get from a CAT scan. So it's not a whole heck of a lot. This is not radiation therapy at all, so you're not going to be blitzed with radiation. The nice thing about uh, nuclear medicine is every six hours depending on the radioisotope. I'm gonna use the, the fairly common one, which is Technesium 99M. Uh, every six hours, half of the material leaves your body naturally. It actually gets out of there quicker. We have what we call a biological half-life in which your body helps scoot the material out of your system fairly quickly. And I think the biological half-life for Technesium, again, is about four hours. So every four hours, half of the dose they give you leaves your body. So, so within about a day, it's basically out of your so you've gotten injected, and then after that, we're gonna bring you into the camera. Uh, and the camera, and I'll put a couple pictures of some different types of nuclear medicine cameras. Uh, are, generally, there's not a lot of noise. Nuclear medicine cameras are fairly quiet. Uh, so the, thing, the cool thing about nuclear medicine is you are the radiation source, not the camera. The camera doesn't spew out anything. It's basically a big collector, so it collects all that information, all that radiation coming off of you is what it collects. Um, and so you're going to be underneath the camera. Now, depending on what type of camera it is, your head's going to be close, but it shouldn't go underneath the whole camera. Again, it depends on the camera design. So I can't guarantee 100% of the time your head's not going to go underneath. What I do know is most people who are claustrophobic can get through uh, most of the pictures. Uh, I have very rarely in, in the thousands and probably what 10,000 exams of these I used to do, uh, very few of them, I'd say like less than 1% couldn't handle the camera in some, in some ways. I, 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 to be honest, I don't think there ever was a patient who we couldn't figure out a way for them to get through the images. And again, it doesn't make any, a, lot, a lot of noise and it takes anywhere from about 15 to 30 minutes to take pictures. It could actually be less by now. Cause like I said, I'm working on 10 year old information. So it might be even faster, uh, nowadays. So basically you just breathe normally. Uh, you just want to hold still and like I said, just keep breathing and uh, we take, it's always good to keep breathing. We, we don't recommend ever stop, you know, five out of five doctors say breathing is a good thing. <laughs> so the pictures will get done. And what that's going to show, show you uh, us is what your heart looks like normally, what the normal blood flow pattern in your heart looks like. And again, once we get done with explaining you how the procedure works, I'll show you some different sets of images and you can sort of see what things look like. The neat thing about these images is they're all in three dimensions. So we look at it from front to back, left to right, and up to down. Um, and so once you get done with that, and then you'll be on to the stress portion of the test. And that could take, uh, depending on how the, the, the flow happens, it could you could be waiting for a while, um, you know, the, the thing with the next part of the test is they'll take, they'll either maybe be in the room. I know for us, we had to take the person upstairs to cardiology and we actually did the stress test in the cardiology. Uh, so again, I'll sort of tell you what our, what the experience is next. So once we get you up to cardiology, they'll normally fit you up to a 12 lead EKG. The EKG is going to give them an, uh, a electro sort of uh, deal of your uh, heart. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's the medical term, the electrical daily. Uh, I think a, a lot of people have seen these on medical TV shows and stuff. Normally those are, are not 12 lead, uh, but so we do a 12 lead. It's more accurate than just a three lead. Um, and so they'll get those on for you. They'll explain the procedure to you. They will uh, make sure you get consent, make sure your questions are answered. And that's one thing I always want you to, rec to, to remind you is make sure if you don't understand anything, ask. That's our job is to tell you what's going on. If you don't understand it, keep asking until you understand. Um, and if you need a translator, make sure you have a translator present. Um, whatever you need, uh, make sure that you understand what's going on. That's, and, and that's, again, our priority. And, I'll, and I know this is, I'm stressing this, but that is our priority as technologists and technicians or whatever word that you wanna use for us is. Um, we're there to make sure you, you understand what's going on. So once we get you set up for the stress test, 
Uh, we're going to get you, uh, there's a couple of different ways we can do it. Uh, we'll start with just the walking uh, test. Basically, you walk on the treadmill and they'll get you to a certain heart rate and then they'll give you an injection right through the IV with you on the treadmill. Uh, and then they'll have you walk for about another 30 seconds to a minute uh, to let that circulate and get into your heart muscle. Uh, and then they'll take you uh, to either get something to eat or right downstairs right away to take pictures or wherever the, the camera is at. Uh, so that's sort of the, the walking test. That's to me is one of the better ways to do the test because it's a physical stress. You know, you can see what you're physically going through. Now, a way that works just as well um, is a drug-induced test. Um, or, so basically a drug-induced test is we use drugs to help simulate exercise because maybe uh, you can't walk or you can't get your heart rate up to that level. Uh, back in the day, we used something called adenosine. Uh, well, back in the day, day when we first started, we used dobutamine, which actually speeded up your heart just like exercise. Not a big fan of dobutamine. Ugh. Good, not so good. Then we used persantine. You could tell from that because it was yellow and it would stain your clothes. Again, it was better than dobutamine, but not as good. Uh, so we used adenosine, which was working really good. I think it was a three to five minute protocol. Uh, the nice thing about it was it, the symptoms came on fast, but they left us just as fast. Um, and so what adenosine is, it's called a vasodilator. So what that basically does, it opens up all your blood vessels. Uh, so instead of uh, being you know, at their normal weight, we, we, them, we get them wide open. So what's your, you're wondering what's the rationale for that? So the rationale for that is if there's a blockage, it's the, the blood's going to go the, through the path of least resistance. So if there's a blockage, we're going to get less of a material in that area because there's, everything else is wide open and the material can get to where it needs to go. Now, when I was going through, um, now when I was a tech, one of the techniques that we learned to actually help people a lot is we'd have you walk slowly on the treadmill and inject the adenosine and you'd get a lot less side effects. Again, the nice thing about the side effects is they go away fairly quickly. They don't linger with you the whole day. So some people would call me the next day and say, oh, I feel awful that adenosine's still working inside me. No, the half-life of adenosine is really quick. Once they turn that adenosine off, it's pretty much gone. Uh, it's not gonna linger past you hours or days later. It's you know probably within 10, 15 minutes, it's all out of your system. Your body, your body can metabolize it and get rid of it. Um, it's probably even faster than 10 to 15 minutes, but I'm going to give you a little longer, longer window to look at. So, so, um, especially if you have a chemically induced test and you did not walk, we're going to want you to eat. We're going to wait at least an hour, uh, from that time in order for us to take some pictures. Now you're probably wondering, well, why do the people who walked get to go down right away and get their pictures taken? Well, so one of the hard parts with, um, the drug-induced test is it can also, we can see a lot of the material in your uh, small intestines. And you're probably like, well, wait, what does that have to do with it? Well, the interesting thing is if you look at some of the pictures, the way that your small intestine can run over right over the lower part, at least on the pictures, uh, over top of your left ventricle. When you're from the side, especially, you'll see a little bit of that intestine. Just It'll just go over top and not physically inside of you, but on our images, it looks like that. In order to get rid of that, in order to get any of the excess tracer that doesn't, that stays in your guts and in your small intestine to get it away, what we have to do is have you eat. Uh, we also like to, you to have cold water as well too. Sometimes I'll just have people drink two glasses of cold water, I'll have them chug it. And then that also helps push down um, any of the material so it doesn't get in front of the heart. And as a drug-induced test, one of the things that uh, potentially could happen is we could have to do some reshoots. Um, and normally uh, what we do is if that's the case, we take your set of pictures again, just like before, it's the same thing before. Uh, so we're doing it like we're doing a test with you at rest and now we're doing that stress portion of the test later. So you're probably wondering, hey, I'm not on the treadmill right now. I'm not uh, being induced with that stressful material. How can my heart should look like it's at rest? Well, the interesting thing about this second radio tracer, which we call uh, normally it's like Sestamibi or Cardiolite or something. The generic name is Sestamibi. Uh, what the, ne the neat thing about this is it stays in that stress for configuration for up to four hours. So you could be taking a nap. You could be listening to uh, wonderful music. You could be having the massage. And to us, it's going to still look like your heart is under that stress condition. And so we take that second set of pictures. So once they get a good set of pictures, and again, if they don't get a good set because of that bowel activity or that stomach or that small intestine activity, 
we'll wait about an hour, take some pictures. The most I've done it is twice where we, we really try to hit, we try not to get close to that four hour window, but sometimes we do. Um, and then we take uh, an, uh, as many pictures as we can uh, until we get a good set of images. And then they basically compare the stress images to the rest images and they should look identical. So that's the big thing. If, if it looks the same on stress and rest, that's a good sign. What happens when we think you've had a heart attack or um, what we can concerns is if we have images on the rest that look one way and on the stress look the other way. If the stress images look worse, what that tells us if you've had some type of cardiac incident um, and that could be a heart attack or any number of different things. But that's what we're looking for is to see because the heart muscle should look the same no matter what the blood flow is, whether it's rest or stress, your heart muscle should be receiving, receiving the same amount of blood. And if it's not, that's a problem. So right now I'll show you what some of the images look like. Um, and so you can sort of see what uh, a normal image looks like and what a abnormal image looks like. All right, so we're gonna take a look at a normal set of images right now. And these are, I don't know if these are stress or rest images, I can't read the image very well, but it sort of gives you an idea. We always tell people to look for horseshoes and donuts and so uh, we can take a look here and you see all the donut you see all the donut walls you see all the horseshoes uh, i'm not going to show you an image right now that shows us uh, a little better understanding anatomy wise of how this stuff is sort of sliced up so let me get pull up that next so if you take a look here so this is how the computer is slicing the heart and so you can sort of see a short axis is is taken like this and you can see what a normal image looks like and now you can sort of see what an abnormal image looks like uh, the other thing here is you can see the horizontal long axis, and again, that's where you get that horseshoe shaped. And again, you have uh, this missing. Uh, the other thing here is we take a look at the vertical long axis again, nice horseshoe, and again, we're missing some here. Now, the thing to think about, though, is, is this, depending on how the images turn out, it can tell us whether it's an infarction, meaning it's dead heart tissue, or that it is ischemic heart tissue, which means lack of blood flow and they can take, put a stent in or something along those lines to fix it. So the way that you figure that out is you have to compare the resting images to the stress images. So let's take a look at a case here of uh, a gentleman who has some uh, infarction. Um, and so you have on top, you have the stress images and you have the rest images right below it. And so that's normally how the doctors would read them. They'll have the stress on top and the rest or vice versa. Uh, what they're do looking for is to see if there's a lot of similarities between the two. Uh, in this case, this person has an infarction. They also have some ischemic heart tissue, which tends to happen too when you have an infarction. But so what I mean by infarction or dead heart tissue, uh, you can sort of see you're not getting that whole horseshoe here. And it's happening in both sets of images, not just in one. Um, so again, like I said, you see a little bit here and here, here and here. Um, so this person has a infarction. Um, and uh, so again, if let's say that the rest images were completely normal and then you had these stress images here where you're not seeing a wall show up, that generally is indicative of ischemia or lack of blood flow to the heart muscle. Again, they can fix that with a stent uh, along those lines. And here's an image that sort of gets us to that. It doesn't give us everything, but we can sort of see here on these uh, views here, you can sort of see the difference between uh, these two sets of images. So this top one's probably stressed. This bottom one is probably rest. They don't have everything labeled so I can easily see it. But making an assumption, I'm assuming that top one is the stress images and the bottom one are the rest images. And again, you can see that ischemia, uh, lack of blood flow in this particular area of the heart. And you can see that it fills in during rest. So there you go. There's a cardiac stress test for you. If you have any questions, put them in the, the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Like I said, one of the best uh, resources for you whenever you have questions is to call the, the, the department that you're having it in as every department works a little differently. But hopefully this sort of demystifies it and you don't get as nervous about the test. So hopefully this makes it easier. Hopefully we just demystified it for you. Hopefully we didn't use too many medical words, medical jargon words that make it hard to understand. If I did, let me know in the comment section below and I'll make sure to clear any of those up. Till the next video, I hope everything goes well and take care and God bless.